Hi, I'm Gary Nall. I'd like to welcome you to a series of discussions on what to do when we're hit by crisis at any time in life. Now, these crises right now are serious because we have multiple crises. We have crisis with the environment. All the projections about how bad things would be and how long it would take to get to that really bad place are off by almost 600%. So it's not going to be 2100 when the glaciers melt and Antarctica and Greenland melt. It's now. In fact, almost every projection we've been given is wrong. So what do we do individually, collectively, as societies? I'm going to deal with that. So environmental issues will be one discussion. What happens when you have a pandemic like now with the coronavirus? That's today's lecture. And I'll be giving a lot of insights, positive insights, not ones to make you afraid and panic everyone, which is what's happening now, which is highly, well, it's highly, it's highly non-productive. When people are panicked, they don't always make the right decisions and also not good for them as far as creating chronic stress. So I'm going to show you some practical, reasonable ways that you can deal with both preventing the virus and if you should be infected, how you can help yourself survive it. This is in addition to what the official pronouncements are. Also, I'll be dealing with what happens if you run out of money. Most Americans cannot write you a check for $500. Over half of Americans can't. That's 165 million people can't write you a check for $500. Well, then this disaster right now is just going to wipe them out. We're going to see more bankruptcies than the system can possibly handle. In fact, it would probably take five to 10 years to process all the bankruptcies. What does a person do in the interim? We were told you'd get $2 million if you're a small business person. Remember how that came out? Now it's $15,000 if you're lucky. Well, from two million to 15,000 is a big difference. Why are corporations getting 100% bailed out? Small business is the backbone of American labor. Well, they're not. And this is how it works. So I'm going to go into depth on this. But anything that can help you in any crisis, whether it's a blackout, uh, fires in Florida, in Texas, in Colorado, in California, and we've had a lot of them destroying a lot of property. It means that where we have lived our whole lives for generations may no longer be sustainable. So where do we go? I'll be giving some insights, the best places to go if you're a family with children, if uh, you want the best education to be around people who are, you know, more progressive. Uh, if you want to go to rural America, I'll, I'll explain the best places to go because we've been doing research on this for about 10 years. And so if you have a health crisis, well, I'll tell you the best way of approaching health crisis. So I've got a whole series of what to do when crisis, all types of crisis. We'll talk about the problem, but more importantly, the emphasis is going to be on positive solutions, things we can apply now. So we'll be showing these relatively short segments, might be any as short as 15 minutes, as long as a half hour. Today is the coronavirus. And there's no great certainties about the coronavirus because so much information, unfortunately, is fragmented. But let's talk about what we do know. We do know that the coronavirus is a deadly virus. It can kill people and does. We also know that it's relatively easy to transmit. We also know that a lot of people, if not the majority of people, have been infected and aren't even aware because they're asymptomatic. And yet they're not asking why. And that's important. Now, I have, I have looked at the communications of leading virologists and scientists from around the world, and none of their voices are ending up in the mainstream media. And the mainstream media seems to be completely biased of accepting only official pronouncements out of the CDC and Anthony Fauci. Is this the same Anthony Fauci who just a few weeks ago said, 1.7 million Americans will die of this. What well, didn't happen? So then it was 200,000 will die of it. Didn't happen. This morning it was 70,000. And I'll bet he's off by a substantial margin. So we should take this seriously. It would be irresponsible not to. But there's a difference between trying to prevent ourselves from being infected and those around us and our coworkers and other citizens from being panicked. Because when someone is panicked, you then have government policies that will stay forever. 
but are implemented as emergency measures now. So if they can get most Americans to stay in their homes or be arrested if they're found outside without going to a medical appointment or a doctor or buying food or are part of what is considered the essential workforce, then think of how easy that would be in the future for any other condition. Why? I don't deal in conspiracy theories. I deal in facts. For those of you who don't know me, I, I wear a couple of hats. One is I am a PhD in human nutrition and public health science. I have been a research fellow at the Institute of Applied Biology, a senior research fellow, and the head of the anti-aging department for over 33 years. I've conducted over 44 clinical studies, and I've published in peer-reviewed literature. I've presented before scientific conferences to thousands, tens of thousands of scientists. I've published over 750 articles, over 100 books, and I've made over 100 award-winning documentaries on various themes. So on that level, being a registered dietitian, being a licensed clinical nutritionist, uh, being an adjunct professor of nutritional sciences at different universities, latest Fairleigh Dickinson, and also having a private practice where I've seen tens of thousands of individuals, and I've done over 400 health support groups where I help people who have illnesses together with lifestyle and behavior modification change their lifestyle and behavior and hence change the outcome of those diseases. So this is something I'm very familiar with. The other hat I wear is as a multi-award winning investigative journalist. I've broken over 300 stud uh, stories, major stories. Uh, my work has appeared on 60 Minutes and two Emmy Awards on 2020 with Geraldo Rivera, on Dr. Brzezinski there, Dr. Lawrence Burton on 60 Minutes, plus many other journalists. That Gabe Pressman did an award-winning 10-part series on the suppression of alternative cancer therapies. That was based upon my work. So I'm always doing work. I've done articles on G5. I've done articles on, on genetically engineered materials. I've done articles on whether vaccines can be proven safe or effective as is claimed, or are there limitations or deficiencies in the science. These are just some of the issues I've dealt with. And I've done a daily radio show on non-commercial radio for 45 years every day, and regular radio show 53 years. So I'm into information, processing information, studying the scientific literature every single day. In fact, as I open up my radio show every day on the PRN.FM, Progressive Radio Network, I give about 20 minutes and every single statement, I only use peer review literature. I cite the peer review, I cite the institutions, whether it's Harvard or Bingham, uh, Brigham Young University or Boston University, Yale. So all my information comes from orthodox sources. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. And right now, people don't know what to believe because on the internet, you'll see all kinds of nonsense and speculation. So all that is set aside. I'm sharing none of that with you. I only share what we have some reasonable belief is accurate. Let me give you some examples. One of the problems of maintaining that this is a worldwide pandemic requiring people to stay in an enclosed environment is that the numbers. Now, first of all, I don't believe that the Chinese released all their actual figures. I believe that we have been given the figures they want to give us. Other countries are more accurate. But then again, there was no universal test that they're developing and some countries are using now to determine if you have the coronavirus, because there are many other coronaviruses, many, but this path, this very serious one. And then the big problem was that the, when the studies were coming out of uh, Italy, and that scared a lot of people, and rightly so, the number of people who were sick and dying really jumped up, spiked way up. Spain was right behind them. And we were looking at this, thinking, well, how come all these people are getting sick and dying? No one pulled back far enough, except some scientists, and we have the charts, we have the information to prove this. The most polluted area of Europe is in one area of northern Italy where under normal circumstances people can die from the air pollution, especially those who are elderly or have uh, morbid uh, co-diseases, 
as, such as emphysema. Now, when you add in that it's an older population to begin with, and they're sick with multiple lifestyle diseases, heart disease, congestive heart failure, cancers, diabetes, obesity, comorbidities, meaning they have <clears throat> one disease, they're going to die from it. It's just how long will it take when they're being treated. Might be a month, might be a year, but that's they're going to die. Now put in a second comorbidity. They have heart disease, congestive heart failure, and emphysema. They're going to die sooner. Put in a third comorbidity, and then it's over, unfortunately, for that person. Now you look at what is the age. We're told everybody's equally uh, culpable. Well, that simply is not true. If, in fact, everyone of all ages was equally capable of getting the disease and dying from it, then you would see the mortality or death rate equal in all age groups, young, children, middle-aged, uh, teenagers, uh, millennials, and older age, and seniors. They would all have about the same. But that's not happening. In fact, almost 98% of the deaths in Italy occurred in people average age over 80 with multiple comorbidities. And even in those who were infected and who then died, it was the, co it was the, more, the, the diseases they already had that was the principal cause of death. The fact that they had the infection then collapsed down the rest of the immune system. But if you took someone that had no other illnesses but had the infection, their mortality rate was very small. But what has happened is we've gotten bad statistics. And in science, if you start off with the wrong information, where are you going to go with it? You're going to then end up making decisions that are inaccurate and could be themselves deadly. So first and foremost, we need honesty by people not associated with the vaccine industry. <clears throat> Because the big answer now is patented drugs. Interesting, because a couple of the drugs that are showing some benefit are off patent, meaning there's no profit to them. So everyone's coming up with a new drug to fight this, or they're coming up with a new vaccine. Gee whiz, why is that not surprising? So the people who have been a problem in the past of profiting off of illness are the same people as is happening today. And people are not scientists, are not medical doctors, should not, in my opinion, be advocating anything where they profit and they have no scientific background. We should allow independent scientists, and we have a lot of them in this world, great women and men of, of uh, stature in their fields, board certified, biologists, molecular biologists, uh, physicians, they should be the ones who are telling us what the truth is. And if they excluded, right now, if they excluded all the comorbidities, meaning all the diseases that a person had before this, you would find out that probably 90%, in fact, that was actually stated by one of the scientists in Italy, 90% of these diseases would not be attributed to the coronavirus. So if 90% are not actually due, deaths are due to the coronavirus, but due to these other pre-existing conditions, then how can you give all the credit for all these deaths to this? That's not good science. That's bad science. And we're doing the same thing in the United States. In fact, even some younger people, we found out, uh, had comorbidities. So we need accurate epidemiology, accurate statistical analysis, and accurate biochemistry. But only 0.3% only of the American population has actually been tested with a good test a PCR test or something that will actually show the virus and then distinguish, is this coronavirus being shown in the blood different than other coronaviruses? If you don't have a very specific test, you might find a coronavirus, but then again, a cold or a flu could be the same coronavirus. So you have to separate out which virus do they have. That means that 99.7% of the American population have not been accurately tested. And then you have to ask this question. If we have asymptomatic cases, meaning people had the virus and they didn't get sick at all, or people had mild conditions, such as maybe a short flu or cold, four or five days later, they're fine, then why that happen? Could it have been because these people had a stronger immune system? And the one thing that will help anyone with any condition is a strong immune system, whether it's cancer or diabetes, the stronger your immune system, 
the greater your body's able to withstand any assault by outside pathogens. So let's get our science right before we start implementing policies that put 16.7 million Americans as of yesterday out of work and at least half of all the small businesses that you can think of in New York and other cities are, are closed. How many will be able to reopen when they already were struggling with high rents and no forgiveness by landlords and high taxes and now they are out of work, no income, and they have debt loads? I predict that probably for the, for the next six months we'll see upwards, especially seasonal small businesses, if they went through a season now and they don't have the income, they'll go bankrupt. Big corporations will be bailed out. That's the way it always is. That's the system. So what are all the employees supposed to do who are employed in those businesses? We're not looking at their needs and we're not looking at the needs of small businesses. We're looking in effect to a policy to restrict cross-contamination. That's fine, but you can do that without closing down businesses. There are masks 95 to 99. I wear a 99 mask. Uh, you can wear, uh, there's a multitude of small ionic air purifiers you can wear around your neck that can create barriers that help trap a lot of the uh, microorganisms, whether they're pollens or danders or allergens, bacteria, viruses, and help you. There are even baseball hats with the uh, plasticized shield that comes down, uh, right down to your chest that would block direct contact you coughing, sneezing, or breathing, and someone breathing, coughing, or sneezing near you. And if you start to combine some of these things with gloves that you can wash and disinfect uh, with proper uh, implementation of hydrogen peroxide, diluted, ble diluted bleach, and high-level alcohol, and then cleaning all surface areas, then there's no reason with uh, allowing, let's say, six people at a time into a, a store and keeping them spaced People are not stupid. The American public are very good at adapting to situations. But rather doing it intelligently than locking people in their homes where many of them are going to be depressed. Some will commit suicide because they can't take that uh, being alone. Many will run out of money to buy food. Where do you think the people, the, the 16.7 million new unemployed, add that into the other unemployed, and that was over 50 million, well higher above that, and they stop being counted in the records because, simple, they no longer could get unemployment or they no longer could find a job. And therefore, to the American statistician, you no longer exist. Well, yeah, they exist. And there are tens of millions of them. You put this two to group, group together and you have at least 10% more unemployed now than at any point during the Great Depression, the greatest unemployment in America. So if they don't have money to begin with, or very little, and we had 16 million children who were food insecure, meaning they're not getting enough food because their parents couldn't afford it. Well, how's a person that's home, not getting money, how are they supposed to buy food? Yeah. How many people are eating cat food? I mean, it's bad. I did a documentary called Poverty Inc., where I found that there were millions of senior citizens who couldn't afford regular tuna, so they were eating cat food tuna a different grade, and no one was come to see them. They'd been abandoned, you know, to a life of loneliness and despair. Now we've got loneliness, despair, and fear, and they're broke. So that's why I'm concerned that we've got to be reason, we have to bring reason and rational thinking and good science and public health science back in. So what can we do? Here are some things we can do. First, the virus can stay in the air for about three hours. That's one person's virus. Now, think of it. We'll close down all these small stores, and then everybody goes to a Costco or Whole Foods or Walmart. We've got hundreds of people per hour, thousands in a day. And for months, nobody wore masks. I was in three of these stores <clears throat> when they were packed. Not a single person had masks or gloves, no barriers, and they were crammed together. How many people then got infected with all forms of microorganisms? So you have to have a way of processing people. If we opened up the small stores and had protections, then people could be serviced, people could be employed again, business wouldn't go out, and still you'd be protected. So the first thing I suggest is get gloves, 
get a mask, get a baseball hat with the shield on it. Costs nine dollars ninety-five cents. All right, they're not expensive, and gloves are not expensive. And now there's more masks being made, high-quality masks. It's how tight the mask fits to your face, and you can spray alcohol and hydrogen peroxide on it inside, outside, and colloidal silver inside, outside, and that adds another layer of protection. Then, clean your surface areas. Now, this is something no one's thinking about. Yeah, they'll clean a doorknob, but are they cleaning the refrigerator handle? Are they the things you open, like a dishwasher? and or anything else. Are you cleaning all the surface areas? Are you putting your toothbrush upside down in hydrogen peroxide to keep it disinfected? Now, when you come home, you should always leave your shoes outside because you'll be tracking everything in-house. Then that dries and goes in the air. But also, you should get inside the door of your home or apartment, take off your clothes, put them in, a, um, in, the, in the laundry with just a little bit of bleach in with your regular, hopefully non-toxic non detergent, your green detergent. That'll sterilize it. But then what do people do? They forget where are most of the germs or viruses landing, and especially if you're in a closed environment or in a place where there are thousands of people, like a Walmart, on your hair. People forget the hair is no different than the clothes. It can last days on your clothes. So you go in and you forget to take off your clothes. You sit on a couch. Now the couch is contaminated. You're touching around. It's on your hands. Now you touch your eyes, you nose, your face about 250 times a day. So now you're infecting yourself over and over again. And that's why you have to keep disinfecting your toothbrush and use, uh, use coconut to massage in when you put your gloves on. But shampoo your hair. Wash your face thoroughly because it's going to be loaded. Beards and mustaches during this period of time, I'd shave them. You can grow them back. But under normal circumstances, beard and mustaches hold a lot of feces because of unsanitary hygiene, body hygiene. And so now add in viruses on top of that, and you have a Petri dish right here waiting to infect you. It's just foolish. Shave it, clean your face, and that way you're protecting yourself. Now, <clears throat> so we're cleaning our area, work area, and the best thing you could do for your environment, home environment, office environment, there are different types of air filters you can purchase. The one I have, in fact, I have one here in this room right behind us here, one in my kitchen, is it's a unit about like this, and it, it is a large unit that will cover about 400 square feet, and that's about the size of this room. It's about $800. A smaller unit covering maybe 200, 250 square feet, which is the size of most people's, let's say, bedrooms or living room or dining room, uh, they're, they're around $400. So yeah, it's an investment, but that you get a seven-stage filter. That's the key. Seven stages, including ultraviolet uh, purification systems. Every possible contaminant and we generally measure contaminant uh, levels and the, the strength and, and the benefit of a, a one of these systems at 0.3 microns. So you want to get down lower than that. So almost everything in the air is going to be killed and when it passes through that filtration system and is passing constantly, 24-7. So your air is going to be clean. So that's going to help minimize what lands on surfaces, including you. It's going to help minimize what's in the air that you could breathe. Now, there are a couple companies making these. I have no association with them, but I'm suggesting that would be the best thing. I have my offices in New York, and therefore we've had no one get sick because we have people take precautions. Now, that's what you can do to help your environment. Also, I, your car, when you get in, alcohol down the steering wheel, all the doors, the starter, and then spray into the vents, the vents bringing air hot air or cold air, spray in alcohol or hydrogen peroxide. That kills anything inside the vent chamber. Do the same thing in your house with your filters. Change your filters, sterilize your filters, put them back into the filtration system for your air conditioner heating, and that's helping you also. And don't look, this floor that I'm standing on now, every day this is uh, alcohol down. It's uh, diluted bleach water. Generally, for one part bleach, uh, there's 20 parts water. 
So you're really sterilizing it. And that way you keep it clean, or as clean as is reasonable. So these are simple things, but the most important thing you can do is build up your immune system. Now researching the scientific literature, and I have articles published and they're up on prn.fm, P-R-N, that stands for Progressive Reader Network.fm, go to the articles on what to do to build up your body's immune system use with it for the coronavirus, and by the way, any other virus, but specifically upper respiratory tract infections. And for the upper respiratory tract infections, here are the nutrients, and we have all the scientific citations from PubMed, and there are thousands of citations. So we showed you vitamin C, your number one, and I would take it throughout the day. That best in buffered form, and if you don't have a buffered form, you can just get ascorbic acid, put it in a shake with a banana and some protein, and then drink your smoothie throughout the day. You're getting your protein, you're getting your phytonutrients, hopefully put some raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, uh, pomegranate in there is great as well, and, uh, and then drink that, because then you're getting your vitamin C anywhere from, let's say, 1,000 milligrams to up to five or 6,000 milligrams. In two separate studies in, uh, in China, at the epicenter, they had thousands and thousands of patients they used intravenous vitamin C and was able to have no one die. Everyone recovered. So now people are using it. Now I work with thousands of patients at the Tri-State Healing Center and intravenous vitamin C, this is back in the 1980s and 90s up to 2000, vitamin C, intravenous vitamin C was the best therapy all the medical staff said, all the doctors, nurses said, Vitamin C is what's helping people with the full spectrum of diseases, from heart disease to cancer to arthritis. So we should be using this first and foremost in, in all the hospitals on patients. I'll bet that if every hospital that was seeing people with coronavirus and comorbidity started using, starting at 20,000, went up to 50,000 units of vitamin C per day intravenous, you would see a substantial reduction in mortality. Next, vitamin D, vitamin D3. I'm suggesting at this time between 10,000 units and uh, 30,000 units a day. And I've looked at all the scientific literature on vitamin D, and it's really powerful for the immune system, especially the upper respiratory tract. The most important, and vitamin E is also important. So C, D3, and E, E at 400, 800 units, from natural mix to cofferols and tocotrienols. The herb that is most powerful for, up, for upper respiratory tract infections, especially viral infections, astragalus. Lots of good scientific literature. Then I would go from astragalus, also a, a liquid, a licorice extract, liquid extract. That is phenomenal. Um, then echinacea is important, but less significant. And those are all good, and there's scientific literature to support them. So I didn't go through all the nutrients, but those are all in the articles, and they're free. They're there as a public service, and we always cite all the scientific literature, again, all peer-reviewed literature to help you. So hygiene is crucial. If you just follow the suggestions, remember, when you go on a subway or in a bus or a car service or a cab or a plane, Always take a little cushion with you. You can buy them, they're inexpensive. They're car, uh, car cushions. People historically bought them because it makes their drive a little com more comfortable. But use that. I've used this for years. Everything I'm telling you to do, I've been doing for years. I use paper towel to push a button on an elevator, to open a door, a cab. And also I have a white envelope and I clean money. Yeah, I just throw it in the laundry and it's sterile, clean. And then I put like a hundred hundreds 100 fives, 100 tens, and 220s, $500. And then when I go out, depending upon how much I need, I take whatever I put a little rubber band around, and I take that and I put it in the clean. So now I'm handling clean money because one of the dirtiest things, one of the most infected things you can possibly touch, dollar bills. Under normal circumstances, forget the viruses, under normal circumstances, there could be over 3,000 different bacteria on a dollar bill. So we're touching money, touching our hands, touching our face. That's how we frequently get infected. I have another envelope, 
And that's where I ask the people, just put my change in there. I've never had a person say, why? They just, fine. I open it up, they put it in there. Hence, I'm not touching money, but I'm transacting. I'm not touching seats. They're on that seat cushion, which I wash with my laundry each day. And I'm shampooing. I'm leaving my do shoes outside. And then if I want to put them inside, I just put them on a mat inside my door. By the way, other cultures do this, like the Japanese. They've been doing this for centuries. It just makes your house more hygienic. I eat a plant-based healthy diet, lots of good juices, orange juice, grapefruit juice, half and half. If you drink orange juice and you're pre-diabetic or diabetic, that can spike your blood sugar. But if you take the juice of two lemons or a lime, a grapefruit, and an orange, that's a great little juice. It gives you about eight ounces of juice. Have that several times a day. Have beet juice is terrific for healing your arteries, by the way, and improving nitric oxide level, which means you get better circulation, which means you're going to be healthier. Beet and pomegranate, two of the best thing juices you can take in. If you can't get the juice or concentrate, just eat the fruit. A green juice each day, such as celery, cucumber, and green apple, terrific for you. And then have at least four glasses of fresh, healthy juice a day, ideally organic. And if you don't have a juice extractor, then buy the concentrates. They're available online, they're not expensive, and they can really fortify your body. Also get out in the sun. People think they have to stay in their house. No, when you go outside, you can go out and exercise as long as you're not around other people and wear a mask. So this way, you're getting sunlight. You need sunlight. In fact, why do we think we always call it the flu season? And many people are saying that a lot of the deaths that are attributed to the coronavirus are actually the flu. Why? Because we found all the charts, the official government charts, of deaths per year for the last 30 years of flu. And they, they're somewhere they can go around 25,000 to 40,000 to 60,000 per year in the United States. People dying. But we found that those figures were manipulated by the CDC. They were combining flu with pneumonia. Influenza with pneumonia. They're two different diseases. Pneumonia is the biggest killer because when we separated out the CDC's figures, flu deaths were here, pneumonia deaths were here. Well, people dying are dying of upper respiratory tract. How many of those are pneumonia and would have died in any case? So we've got to have good science. But in any case, we know that there's a flu season. And in hot weather and sunlight, that's building up your immune system. You're getting upwards of 20,000 units of vitamin D when you're in direct sunlight over half your body for an hour. So the more you're in the sun, the healthier you're going to be. Exercise. You don't want to be sedentary. You shouldn't be sitting or lying down for more than two hours at a time except when you sleep at night because it's bad for circulation. So get up and do exercises. Do aerobics. There are free videos on the internet that show you how to do Chair yoga, so if you have any impairment, you can still do yoga, even with a chair. How to 